If I'd known that I was going to be competing with Beyonce, I might not have come today. Did you hear that? Beyonce got something in town, and so maybe that's why a few of the seats are empty today, but it's okay. I'm excited to be here. As the, my colleague said, I am Lisa Lamberts. I am the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at National Grid, and I am the founder and president of National Grid Partners. And for those that don't know either of those companies, National Grid is a UK-based transmission and distribution utility based in, in, in the UK, but with assets uh, in the Northeast. National Grid Partners is the corporate venturing and innovation arm of National Grid. I am honored to be here. This is my first ETS. How many have been to ETS multiple times? Am I the only newbie? All right, actually, we got some veterans here. This is my first ETS. I am thrilled to be here. I worked at Intel for 20 years, so also happy to be in Austin. I spent a lot of time in Austin with Dell being here. We were back and forth between Silicon Valley and Austin during most of my tenure at Intel. On a personal note, I am also a big fan of college sports. I was a scholarship athlete at Penn State University. When I walked into my hotel last night, they said, this is University of Texas territory. This is University of Texas country, the Longhorns. How many Longhorns do we have in the house? Ex-Longhorns, nobody? All right, all right. Well, I'm a big fan of college sports. I think I actually may love college sports more than I love energy, if that's possible. But uh, I'm glad to be here for that. And what I wanted to do today was share a little bit about my journey at National Grid, National Grid Partners. One of the first things that people say to me is, why in the world would you leave a successful career in high technology at a company like Intel to join a utility, an energy company? I mean, why would you do that? And I think it's a legitimate question. But the more that I reflected on this, uh, the more that I realized that energy powers Silicon Valley. I mean, there is no Silicon Valley without the energy sector. There's no digital revolution. There's no smartphone. There's no software eating the world. None of that exists without the energy sector. And it had a great run in the 2000s, but has you know, been set back since that time. And because energy is the backbone of Silicon Valley and really the backbone of every industry, the electrons power computers, they power transmission uh, and telecommunication companies, they power the transportation system, uh, it's a, a sector that needs some attention. And it was massive, even in Silicon Valley back in the 2000s. If you recall, every major venture capital firm and literally thousands of energy tech startups was irrationally exuberant about the category. There's a big firm in Silicon Valley called Kleiner Perkins. They were largely a software-based venture capital firm. And in the 2000s, during the clean tech era, they shifted two-thirds of their investment focus to clean tech. Vinod Kessler uh, of Kessler Ventures is also a rock star on Sand Hill Road and in Silicon Valley. He said clean tech was the new main tech. All things should be driven by clean tech, sustainability, climate change. That was affecting every aspect of society. And so he was a massive fan of it. And so clearly there was some irrational exuberance there because that changed in 2008 when the bubble burst. But when I reflect on what happened during that period, there actually were a lot of really big companies that were born out of that era. Impressive companies like Tesla, like Sunrun in the residential solar and, and storage uh, asset business, like ChargePoint. I mean, some really great multi-billion dollar market cap companies or companies like Green that got acquired for multiple billions of dollars. And I think even more important, and part of the reason that I'm standing here today, is that there were a bunch of companies that survived the 2000s and survived the crash. They made it through. They eventually got product market fit, they eventually scaled, and they became profitable. Those are the companies that we're investing in. Those are the companies that we're focused on. And that really is the backbone of what I call Clean Tech 2.0. The market is actually coming back. Um, in 2009, right after the crash, we had about a billion dollars invested in the clean tech sector, a dramatic drop off from the prior years. 
but that number has gone up 300%. It's $4 billion as of January of 2017, and that number continues to increase. And of course, the three Ds, decentralization, digitization, and decarbonization, of course, is driving that trend even further. So it really is a disrupt or be disrupted kind of era that we're living in. And the fact is that every industry is being disrupted by the startup community. If you look at the media sector, massively disrupted. Companies like Amazon and Netflix. You look at the transportation sector, Uber and Lyft, Tesla, all disrupted. You look at the hospitality sector, Airbnb massively disrupted it. And financial services still being disrupted. Companies like Square and PayPal and SoFi. And all of that disruption happened right in the face of the incumbents. They did absolutely nothing about it. In fact, if you read some of the testimony of some of the articles that came out during that time, they were saying how it was a fad, that it wasn't going to affect their business. They didn't really need to take it seriously, which is amazing to me. The example in uh, the disruptive category that I like to use for utility companies is telecommunications, because I think it's most similar to the utility sector. It had this enormous moat around it. It was a monopoly business. Uh, a lot of assets, fiber optics in the ground, great balance sheet. And so, you know, on the surface, you look at that industry and you say, this is an impenetrable industry. There's no way in the world telecom is going to be disrupted. And then you look at the mid-2000s. Apple, Google, smartphone, app stores, iTunes, all of that came and massively and forever changed the telecom industry. Right where they were they're observing it, which is an amazing fact to me. They did absolutely nothing. It was a $200 billion industry in the 1990s when the telecom industry owned it. And by the 2010 time frame, another $620 billion in new revenue pools were created by the likes of Apple and Google and other companies like it. All of that revenue accrued to those companies. Only $80 billion in revenue by the 2010 time frame actually went to the telecom providers. So all of that value creation and the companies that had great balance sheets, had a great history, had assets in the ground, did absolutely nothing about it and missed the entire movement. The same thing is happening in the energy sector. And I think we're kidding ourselves that we think that's not the case. It's true that energy and I'd say logistics and healthcare and manufacturing haven't been disrupted at the same pace that some of these other industries that I mentioned has been disrupted. But you can't deny that it's happened. There are too many unicorns in the energy sector to deny that it's happened. Companies that didn't even exist 20 years ago that now have multiple billion dollar market caps. And I think the software and data revolution is also impacting. If you think about the utility sector, it's already decentralized. Um, it's already virtualized. There's virtual power plants. It's actually moving in the direction of self-service. Um, and DERS is helping to drive that. Distributed Energy Resource is helping to drive that. And so it's actually not incomprehensible that a peer-to-peer -peer exchange that prosumer, prosumers lead could happen in our lifetimes, where prosumers are buying and selling energy to their neighbors. That, I think, is very possible. So that's also accelerating the growth. And so on that backdrop, National Grid looked at the landscape and said, we believe it. So many CEOs said, we don't believe it. John Pettigrew had the vision, who's our CEO, to say that we believe the trends that are happening. We need to do something about it. And so they reached out to me. At the time, I was at the West of the Group, which is a clean tech venture capital firm. So I had left Intel, um, the safety of Intel, after 20 years at Intel to go join a clean tech firm because I saw the trends and I believed that it was something that could be capitalized on. They went and put together a very nice offer for me, convinced me to come and build what is now called National Grid Partners. And as they say, it's the venturing and the innovation arm of National Grid. There are five functions within National Grid, just to give you a little perspective on what we've been building. Uh, the first function is our innovation capability, and this is the the part of the business that develops new products, new technologies, new services, monetization strategies, new business models, does spin-ins and spin-outs. So it's really the creative capability of National Grid Partners. And it's the future-proofing aspect of what we do. 
Our second function is the incubation function, and it, it's what it sounds like. It's an incubator uh, capability. We're just opening an office in San Francisco to house this incubation function. And in that, we invest in seed stage companies. Um, so we're not starting companies ourselves, but we're investing in seed stage companies, and then we're co-locating them in our San Francisco office with our goal of accelerating the growth of those companies and, of course, getting engagement for National Grid. The third function is our corporate venture capital group, um, and it's corporate venture capital just like it is in any other company. It's expansion and growth stage investing. It's also fund-to-fund -fund investment, so we're, we invested in uh, energy impact partners. We've got two other fund-to-fund -fund investments that we're making uh, with the goal of expanding our geographic reach. So we invested in a company in the UK, fund of funds general partnership, and we invested in a general partnership in Israel because we think we've got great ideas coming from both of those markets. And the fifth function, and I think a very important function, is addressing the issue of culture. You know, as you all know, the utility sector is not known for being yeah, out-of-the-box thinking. It's a regulated industry. Um, it's a regulator-driven innovation cycle, eight to 10-year kind of regulator innovation cycles. So it's not known for you know, being an out-of-the-box thinker. So one of the things that we put on our mandate is to help change the culture. And so we launched our Venture Fellows Program, which is an apprenticeship program designed to bring in people from National Grid, let them spend two years within National Grid Partners, learn the skills of innovation and investing and incubation, and then go back into the operating businesses with that new skill set and help change the culture, change the mindset. So those are the five functions of National Grid Partners. We officially came on the scene in November of last year. We did our brand launch. We named ourselves National Grid Partners. Uh, we launched our first five investments. We actually did a networking reception in Palo Alto on that uh, evening. We had over 400 utility experts, entrepreneurs, some of our portfolio companies, some of our colleagues in the broader venture capital and uh, the high-tech industry, all at that event. We had great press uh, on the event. We did a local and trade press interviews for the most part embargo before the actual launch. Our CEO announced it with the earnings. And so it was really a big splash and kind of a big deal. Again, utilities just aren't known for doing this kind of thing. We've got 50 employees within National Grid Partners. Right, which is a really big undertaking. I mean, at Intel, we had 100 investment professionals, but that's Intel. It's 60 billion in revenue, 110,000 employees. So for a company the size of National Grid, 25,000 employees, doing something on this scale, $250 million fund, we're investing 75 to 100 million a year. And then we come out the gate with, with six investments. We've since announced two additional investments. And we've got another seven investments that we're going to announce when we do our open house in San Francisco to, to open up our... Uh, incubation center. Our CEO is going to come down for that. So we're going to do another press release, have another kind of a, a big event to, to announce the opening of that office. But it really is uh, impactful and really is unusual for the utility sector to do what we're doing. Uh, we have a great website that I want to encourage you to go to. It's at ngpartners.com. We've got portfolio company testimonials. We've got interviews from our employees. We've got blog articles. We've got case studies on the work that we're doing to not only deliver financial value in return for our investments, but to deliver strategic benefit to National Grid. And we've been busy. So the first 15 months, I was hiring, standing up these organizations, and then getting ready to launch National Grid Partners officially. The portfolio is actually very strong, and it's pretty eclectic. Our mandate is to invest in energy and IT. We need to upgrade the operating technology of National Grid and its information technology. So we're focused on both. Uh, the first eight investments, I'm hoping I'll get all of them. Uh, Apparetto was one. It's a cloud uh, security company. AutoGrid is another. It's a predictive analytics company for DERS, primarily. And Dragos is an industrial control system cybersecurity company. We invested in Leap, which is a Dura's marketplace. We invested in Omnidian, which is a performance management solution for solar assets. Uh, we also invested in Pixium, which is an edge computing software solution for the Internet of Things. 
And then lastly, we invested in SiteTracker, which is a physical infrastructure project management solution. So it kind of replaces the primaveras of the world that Oracle acquired. So it's a very robust uh, portfolio, very compelling portfolio. You're going to see seven more investments and any investments that we do between now and June 12th when we have our open offs in San Francisco come out, and they're going to be equally compelling. The other part of what we do is not only produce financial returns for the company, but deliver strategic value. And as part of those first 12 investments, we sign eight business collaboration agreements with national grid businesses to deploy them. So we're doing proof of concepts, we're doing pilots. In some cases, we have actual deployments of the technologies that are in our portfolio. So the strategic transformation of what we're doing at National Grid is really a vital, important of it, part, part of uh, National Grid Partners and something that we focused very heavily on. All right, so the moral of the story is take some risk, even though culturally your company may be complacent, may be in the status quo, may be relying on that big moat called a regulatory uh, frame and environment to protect its business model, inevitably and invariably, those businesses will be disrupted. Every example that I gave you were businesses that had the same regulatory frame, great balance sheets, and thought they were safe and secure. But in reality, they weren't. So make the leap. Don't do it alone. Leveraging the global startup ecosystem um, and strategic partnerships in a way to help you get there I think is the best way to, to make it all happen. You're not going to do it by yourself. There's too much happening in the world. Innovators have great insight, and they're unencumbered by business models and legacy products and infrastructure and high costs. So partner with them. National Grid Partners is an example of how you can do that successfully. And I hope you'll take up the, the mantle and go along with me to stay ahead of what's happening in the innovation ecosystem. If you have comments about what we're doing here at National Grid Partners, feel free to go out to our website. Uh, reach us at hashtag potential of energy. Make some comments about it. It's been a pleasure for me to be with you here today uh, and an honor to be back in Texas where everybody is so hospitable and, and where everything is big, like big food and big women. <laughs> so it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for the time. And I hope you have the rest of uh, the conference is good. Cheers. <laughs>